Perfect. So good afternoon, everybody. And thank you for joining our positive impact panel session about biodiversity net gain. I'm Isabel Chazal de Bancion, and I'm Innovation yes. Lead for Geovision. So what is Geovision? Geovision is the innovation hub for own and survey, and it's the heart of an ecosystem focusing on using location data to deliver sustainable innovation. We support startup and innovators in the wide sense of the term, and so far, we have supported over 160 startups in different ways. We run several accelerator streams for early stage startups, including one focusing on geotech startups with own and survey, one in collaboration with HM Land Registry focusing on PropTech, as well as a stream with registers of Scotland on geotech and PropTech based in Scotland. As a side note, the call for the accelerator is open, so if you know a startup, uh, that is early stage and meets the criteria, feel free to share the call with them. And we also deliver a series of events, including panel sessions like today, more technical events as well. And last year, we've launched the Geospatial Innovation Awards. And they're an award celebrating how geospatial innovation can positively shape the world. Now, before we deep dive into the subject at hand today, I will go through a little bit of housekeeping. So first, we're on a large team call, so please make sure that unless you're one of the panelists, you, you're on mute, you turn your camera off, and most of all, you avoid sharing your screen. As you know, and you've seen the, the pop-up, the call is recorded, and it will be shared in our YouTube channel, and it will be disseminated amongst our community. Now, feel free to use the chat to introduce yourselves, your organizations, where you're from, even where you are at at the moment. And if you have any questions for the panelists or any question at all, feel free to put it on the chat and we'll try to answer the questions. And the last thing is I have a special request for you. We are always very keen to improve the panel sessions we do. We want to make sure that what we do is useful. We want to make sure that the subjects we're, we're kind of talking about are relevant. So please make sure you take some time, just a few minutes to fill in the survey that will be put in the chat. Um, during the, the panel session today. Now, housekeeping finished. So now on the very topical subject of biodiversity net gain. So as a general rule, we will try and avoid using acronyms, but for simplicity today, we will say, and we will use BNG for biodiversity net gain. Otherwise it's gonna take forever. And to set the scene, I will start with a number. 60%. And bear that in mind, 60%, because according to Dr. Purvis from the Natural History Museum, since 1970, the UK has experienced 60% of decrease in biodiversity. So think about it, 50 years and 60% in decreased biodiversity. And that's with that in mind that biodiversity net gain BNG going live in less than three weeks We'll hope to reverse that 50 years of degradation. So the BNG has been introduced in the Environment Act of 2021 as a mandatory requirement for all new developments in England. And it is based on the idea that any development should not just avoid harming biodiversity, but contributes to its restoration wait, wait. and enhancement. So to secure planning permission, developers will have to submit a bio diversity gain plan, BGP, assessing the habitat value of the land they will be developing and providing a measurable plan of how they will create a net uplift in biodiversity of at least 10% and over a minimum period of 30 years. So 30 years is a very long time. And the biodiversity value is measured through the biodiversity metric. Now there are three avenues by which biodiversity value can be incorporated into a development proposal. The first is the favorite one, the most preferable, and is by doing creating on-site environmental benefits to enhance the habitat value directly. The second, less favorable, is registering an off-site net gain that has been allocated and approved as part of the development project. And the last option, 
is obtaining a statutory biodiversity credit from the Secretary of State. Obviously, that's the least favorite option. Now, I will finish that scene setting here because we're very lucky today to have brilliant panelists from all sides of the process. So I will ask our panelists to briefly introduce themselves, starting with Helen. Thank you, Isabel. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Helen Newell. I'm Group Head of Biodiversity at um, Barrett Developments. Barrett Developments is one of the UK's largest house builders and my role at Barrett is really to help our 29 divisions understand uh, the legislation around biodiversity net gain and how they can meet uh, the challenges associated with that. Thanks Helen. Gareth, do you want to go next? Yeah, really good to meet everyone on the call. My name's Gareth Proof. I'm a planning consultant uh, and I work for an organisation called the Planning Advisory Service. If you've not heard of us, another acronym, Isabel, is PAS, Planning Advisory Service. Um, we're part of the local government family, we're part of the local government association, small team based centrally. But what we do is work with local authorities across the country to help support and improve their planning service. So I suppose we, we give that local authority perspective on things like biodiversity net gain. We've got a number of projects on the way, uh, underway at the moment, but a big one is obviously around BNG. And as part of that, we work with over 300 local authorities on, on net gain. So I think it's some of that experience that I want to share today. Thank you, Gareth. Fantastic to have you. Uh, Rafi, we know you really well because you obviously Verna, your startup has been part of the accelerator. But please introduce yourself. Yes, very happy to be here. We were part of the the 2023 cohort. Uh, so I'm I'm Rafi Cohen, uh, one of the co-CEOs of Verna. Uh, we build software to help local planning authorities to implement biodiversity net gain. Uh, our primary software product, Mycelia, uh, is already being used by LPAs across the country to help them with every aspect. Um, of of implementation and, and ensuring biodiversity net gain is done uh, properly. Local planning authorities is absolutely key to the whole process, so we're really pleased to be working very closely with uh, a large number of them. Thank you, Rafi. And last but not least at all, Joe. Hello everyone, I'm Joe Heath. I'm the Head of Environment and Biodiversity at the Land Trust. So we're a land management charity um, it covers all of England, about 2,800 hectares of land. And our role with Biodiversity Net Gain is to offer the on-site, off-site solutions to developers such as Barrett, um, also commercial retail developers. So our role is very much with the land management side of it, delivery of BNG over and above 30 years. Thank you very much, Joe. So we're really lucky to have all of you here. And thank you again for taking the time to join us this afternoon. So I will start with a few questions and I will start with you, Gareth if this is okay for you. So from your experience with working with local authorities, what are the motivations for BNG and what are some of the expected benefits of the BNG regulation? Yeah, well, I think it's really important. You, you mentioned a bit of a killer fact earlier on, didn't you, in terms of the loss of habitat and nature across the country. And I think that is a lot of what's driving it. So, I mean, we understand the, the UK as a whole, you know, we're at the bottom of the G7 nation list for biodiversity. We're, we're in the bottom 10% globally. So it is a really big national issue. And I think it's fair to say that over the last 70 years, that time period you mentioned, a lot of our nature conservation effort has been very much focused on preserving small pockets of nature, designated sites, protected sites or protected species. And this approach clearly isn't working that well because we can see that type of loss. So the, the real effort behind net gain is a real paradigm shift to try and move to actually promoting and protecting the whole network of nature, encouraging nature across, you know, network, the, the natural networks that it operates in, but also improving it as well. And that's the government's ambition is to leave the environment in a measurably better place than what we um, uh, kind of uh, started with for future generations. And I think for local authorities, the key thing is that, that, that nature isn't just a nice thing to look at or enjoy. It's really critical. I mean, some of the other crises that we're facing, so things like the climate change crises, nature has a really big role to play in helping us to find solutions to that. You know, things like flood mitigation, urban cooling, 
all those type of things that are really important for helping us to deal with 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 climate crisis. You know, we know we've also got big health pre problems in the country and certainly in a lot of our local areas. So, you know, we know that nature and the natural environment is so important to good health and importantly placemaking as well. And that's where a lot of planners get excited about uh, biodiversity net gain because, you know, local or, or planning authorities are all about creating successful places and successful places for people to live. And obviously the natural environment plays a big role in, in that as well. And I think one of the ambitions is, is by introducing mandatory net gain to new development, we can start to address the real problem, which is that kind of conflict between new housing, new building, and the natural environment. So we know we've got a housing crisis, we know people need new homes, we know we're not meeting our house building targets, and a lot of that is driven by local people's concern about the loss of the environment and what net gain is around actually showing that new development can actually bring new and improved local environments. So I think Thanks, I'll leave Gareth. it there, I could talk longer. <laughs> uh Thank you, Gareth. And uh, it's great to remind us and to kind of uh, put in perspective the fact that it's not just about uh, the environment in terms of um, the the life and the, the nature, but it's really about also the kind of secondary effects that it has uh, throughout the climate crisis and um, on humans as well. So um, in the very brief introduction of uh, I've done, uh, I have mentioned the biodiversity metric as a key element for the BNG. I think, Rafi, it would be great if you could just tell us a bit more about the metric, the complexities around it and how it is to implement it. Sure. Um, so the, the metric is absolutely central to all of BNG uh, and it quantifies BNG at all stages of the process. So it might be worth me just uh, elaborating on that a little bit. So in terms of the BNG process, uh, it works with a planning system. So it starts with a planning application and a baselining of what uh, level of biodiversity there is on a on a site at at the start of the process, and then over the thirty year requirement for management uh, for uh, for, mon for management and monitoring of the the ground, uh, biodiversity needs to be quantified over that time as well. So the biodiversity metric is a quantification tool that allows that to happen, and the idea is that. Uh, it's it kind of gives a, a, a single source of truth around the calculation techniques. Now, biodiversity is much more complex uh, to measure than carbon with climate and, and many other things, because you're dealing with thousands of different species that keep moving around. Uh, and so the view was taken, uh, I think, quite sensibly to measure uh, habitats as opposed to biodiversity. Biodiversity is the living part of nature, um, animals, plants, etc. Uh, habitats are uh, much more kind of general and stable uh, than species. So it might be a grassland or a type of broad or, or type of broadleaf woodland or something like that. And so the biodiversity metric uses habitats as a proxy for uh, biodiversity. So uh, so so that you kind of have some sort of consistency uh, over time and it's more meaningful. And so uh, kind of in a sentence, then bringing that together, it's an Excel document. Uh, that serves as the calculation tool for biodiversity uh, within the context of biodiversity net gain. Thank you, Rafi. And obviously, the um, one side of the equation is um, are the developers, and the the introduction of BNG has got a non negligible impact on the approach developers can have. So, Helen, do you want to elaborate around that and? Can you kind of walk us through some of the ways developers are able to offset their biodiversity liability? Yes, I'm happy to do that. Um, so um, if you think about actually, Isabel, you kind of mentioned the, the three different ways that the, the developer can go about mitigating for their impact. So you can either do it on site within your, we'll call it the red line boundary. So your development parcel is called the red line boundary. So you can you can offset your your or manage your impact on site so that you can achieve a biodiversity net gain within that red line boundary. Failing that you would then look to um, source biodiversity units off site. Um, and to do that, you'd need to find a provider. So somebody who had already had land available and had gone through the process of setting up 
uh, a biodiversity offset from which you could then buy uh, your units from. And then finally, um, we have in place now the government's uh, statutory credit system. So if all else fails, you can't do it on site, you can't do it off site, you would then look to purchase those units from, from the government or those credits from the government. But fundamental to that process is what we call the, the mitigation hierarchy. So the mitigation hierarchy is one of the key principles around uh, the biodiversity net gain process. And what it asks you to do is to look at your site, your red line boundary, and um, get a better understanding of the value of biodiversity on that site in the first instance. So you're not automatically going to an offset, you're not automatically going to credits, you're looking at how you can deliver the biodiversity um, uh, requirement within the red line boundary. And the first step on that mitigation hierarchy is all about avoiding impact in the, in the first place. Then you would go to minimising your impact and then you would go to uh, enhancing or, or mitigating or compensating for that, that um, uh, impact within the red line boundary. There's some um, uh, kind of key considerations that you might want to look at when you're trying to do this. So if your site is actually quite ha has actually got quite a high biodiversity value on there, it's going to be really tricky to avoid a lot of that. It's going to be hard to get the, 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 the numbers right to stack up. And um, if there's a large amount of, of um, biodiversity rich habitats within that, because that biodiversity from a from a, a commercial perspective, that 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 habitat type it's actually quite costly um, to mitigate for. It can take a long time to recreate or be tricky to recreate. So you're trying to avoid those, those rich areas of biodiversity within your red line boundary as much as possible. Um, and then the other point, though, is um, around biodiversity offsetting is that the market for biodiversity offsets is still quite, um, it's still quite young. Essentially, there's a lot of people that are talking about um, providing biodiversity units in, within the market. But there's a kind of a lack of confidence. So if they establish those biodiversity units, who's going to be buying them from them? So and there's obviously a financial upfront um, kind of cost to, to establishing that. So the market is in a, this limbo situation, which means if you can't deliver on site, you're not necessarily going to be able to find a biodiversity offset provider nearby to help you manage that impact or mitigate for that impact. So then the final option, as we've mentioned, is the is the government credits and the government credits have been put in place to ensure that the um, the uh, that the development can still carry on in the absence of any offsets. You can still carry on um, uh, development and. Uh, However, they are the last line of defence. So you you would have to have demonstrated that you've gone to, you've done as much as you can on site, you've looked for those offsets, they're not available. This is the only way that we're going to carry on. But the other thing that they've done is that they've priced those biodiversity credits actually very high, much higher than you would expect to source from a, a, an offset provider locally. And they've done that because they don't want to outcompete with the local market. They want to get that market going. So, um, yeah, I think I hope that explains kind of the, the three options and the different kind of considerations that we have to to take on board when we decide how we're going to deliver that and meet our obligation. Thank you very much, Helen. And I think it's a it's a very interesting uh, in terms of approach and the changes are non -neg negligible. And we have to bear in mind that um, BNG hasn't yet started, as in it's going live on the 12th of February. So, you know, everything is in the making. And uh, Joe, the Land Trust has done loads of research um, and work around uh, the mitigations that uh, Helen mentioned around uh, on-site and off-site. Um, from your experience, you know, what does a successful BNG actually look like? Um in the first instance, um, if you're doing, looking at biodiversity in a game for it to be successful, you should be really following the 10 good practice principles um, that outline some of what Helen's already touched on, so the mitigation hierarchy, uh, stakeholder engagement, ensuring that the units or the offsetting is local, there's the trading rules in there, but they're now put into the metric as well, um, and looking to deliver wider benefits and ensuring credible, and credible biodiversity units and transparency. So as a starting point, you should really be following that best practice principles. Um, there is a BS standard for biodiversity net gain, but that really focuses on the design and the early stages. There's not much in terms of 
best practice for onwards delivery, and that's partly what Heading's been touching on there, credibility, um, integrity of the biodiversity units that might be on the market, um, who's delivering them. There's not gatekeeping on who can own and manage biodiversity net gain at the moment. There are with other types of offset mitigation, but with BNG, anybody can deliver biodiversity net gain on site and off site. So there is a lack of gatekeeping, which could cause some issues further down the line if units aren't delivered and they're not sustainable. Thanks a lot, Joe. I was taking notes. <laughs> Got cut off. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so the implementation of PNG comes with its set of, set of challenges, as you mentioned, uh, gatekeeping being one of them. Um, and it's uh, the challenges are for all the stakeholders involved in the planning process. And if we start with the local authorities, Gareth, um, you know, <clears throat> local authorities have an incredible role to play in uh, in that. What yeah. do you think, you know, what are the challenges? What challenges are you expecting? And yes. how do you think local authorities can address them? OK, um, right, I, I will, I will. I'll try and be as succinct as I can because there are a lot <laughs> in so much as I think biodiversity again is a new initiative you know we've used the word like paradigm shift and addressing a nature crisis so it's big for local authorities like it is big for house builders and developers and 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 I think you know for the for the country in general but the, it's causing a lot of excitement at the moment because the time scales are very tight so you mentioned Isabel Biodiversity net gain goes live on the 12th of February. So any planning application from the 12th of Feb onwards will need to deliver 10%, but there's lots of different types of planning applications. So just to be clear, biodiversity goes live for ma the majority of majors, the, the decent sized planning application from the 12th of February. But smaller applications like miners, so miners are things like housing sites of less than 20, 10 dwellings or one th less than 1,000 square metres of employment land. That doesn't go live until the 2nd of April. And then we have some of the really big strategic infrastructure, things like power stations and solar farms. That doesn't go live till 2025. I, I say that because just to exemplify, there's a heck of a lot happening, isn't there, when it comes to this front. So the, I think the first challenge is that small window of time. How do we get organised? The, the legislation is there, the secondary guide uh, legislation has only just been published, some of the guidance is in draft, so the, a lot of local authorities are still kind of digesting this information and there's still some questions that, you know, we don't necessarily know know how to, 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 to answer completely yet. So I think it's fair to say to people listening, there will be bumps in the road for all of us. But when it comes down to it, one of the big challenges will be the, the skills and capacity of local authorities to deal with this. Now, a lot of authorities do have ecologists, for example, but a lot don't. You know, we have 300 and odd different local authorities, so it's really hard to generalise. But, you know, I was speaking to one authority in Derbyshire, a district in Derbyshire, and they just don't employ an ecologist. So how do they make sense of net gain? You know, they're developing partnerships with other organisations like local wildlife trusts to bring in some of that expertise. We recommend that local authorities increasingly look cross-border as well to work with their neighbours. And certainly some areas like Greater Manchester Manchester, they're in a lot better position than others because under the combined authority, the 10 local authorities there work very closely together. They've got a joint plan, they've got a joint timeline, they've identified areas of opportunity for net gain at that kind of strategic level. So I think that's really important for local authorities as well. But also, one of the other issues, and I'm sure that we'll come to this throughout this debate, is around how we monitor and enforce net gain as well. So you've mentioned it. The, the, the law states that net gain has got to be delivered for 30 years or more. That's a long time for a local authority to monitor. You know, we're, we're used to monitoring a development until it's built and finished, and then it's kind of down to the public to tell us if anything's going wrong. But net gain requires 30 years of monitoring and, uh, and, and maybe some enforcement as well. So, you know, how do we set ourselves up for that technologically and organisationally? Some of, as, as Helen said, some of this net gain is delivered not just on the site but off-site. Now that that off-site location it might be in the same local authority but it could be somewhere else and so how do we get round that 
in terms of monitoring enforcement as well. And, and then there are new concepts like habitat management and monitoring plans. We've got to get our heads around and understand what they look like and what a good one looks like as well. So through, through PAS and the Local Government Association, I think we are encouraging local authorities to work together. We have a stakeholder model, so a, a sector led model where we think there's some local authorities doing this really well and others can learn from that. But a lot and equally, um, we work a lot with the private sector through the Future Homes Hub, which are doing a great job because I think private housing developers and local authorities have got a lot in common on this and we need to be helping each other get along along the line. But but the other final thing I'd like to mention, I think particularly relevant to this audience, is just the amount of data and information that authorities are going to have to take on board with this as well. So there's new data and new information about this thing called net gain in sites in your area or outside your area and that all needs to be brought into our existing planning data and people like Rafi will know some of the back office planning systems are not that sophisticated and haven't changed that much in about 30 years time. There's a whole range of things that I think we are looking for innovation and enterprise to help us support and address. Thank you Gareth and uh, yeah I think Local authorities are, are really facing a tough challenge now uh, with so many things to address in a, in a very short amount of time. Um, but the other side are developers and uh, and as we mentioned, the you know the thirty year um, is a long time to look at um, at um, the progress of a ten percent of biodiversity increase. How does that affect cost? And how do you approach that um, in terms of uh, the creation of the biodiversity unit market as well, Helen? So in terms of costs of biodiversity net gain, it's um, and I think this is one of the main challenges for the developer sector it isn't necessarily the cost. Because we have done um, at Barrett, we've done we've been working on biodiversity net gain for for, I would say, almost four years now, maybe coming up to five, where we initially got involved in helping to um, uh, author the uh, Biodiversity Net Gain Guidance document that CIEM, Syria and, and AIMA put together. So that was that was a while ago. Taking that information, we did retrospective assessments on a handful of our, our developments. So looking to apply that guidance uh, uh, and, and trying to, to work out whether or not business as usual, the way we normally design and develop our 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 um our um our developments, and um, whether business as usual was going to help us achieve a biodiversity net gain. And quite frankly, no, it wasn't. Because what we were doing was taking the ecology information too late in the day. We were basically designing our developments in absence almost of some of that ecology information. So if we took that information to the front end of our design and uh, development lifecycle process, we could actually achieve a biodiversity net gain within our developments without it costing fundamentally more than what we were already having to do in the first place. The issue comes when you start to bring in the consideration too late in the day and you're having to go to potentially an offset, which A is not available, B could be much more than you had put in your viability plan plans right at the beginning. So really having a clear understanding of what the requirements are and front loading your ecology and landscaping is key to managing those costs along the development life cycle. And I think because biodiversity net gain is still very new to, to a lot of developers out there, and it's, it's going to be difficult for especially SME developers to really get their heads around this, and um, that's where, where we're going to see some really inflated costs and issues around that. Um, but I, yeah, I work uh, with the Future Homes Hub to try and deliver some of this, this key messaging and learnings that we've had to, to other developers in the sector and, and work with uh, Gareth's uh, colleagues at PAS to, to kind of disseminate those, those uh, learnings as well. Thank you very much, Helen. And I can definitely, as, a, as an architect and having built uh, quite a few um, building uh, across the country, I can see how the integration of uh, <clears throat> biodiversity in the thinking and the development early on um, will a shift how we design buildings, but also uh, can be, you know, a way to not make it uh, kind of an afterthought uh, and therefore add so much cost to it. Uh, <clears throat> 
sorry, uh, Rafi, tech bottlenecks. Uh, you know, obviously, time is short. What do you see and what do you anticipate uh, in terms of bottlenecks in uh, the implementation of BNG? Sure. So there's there's lots of kind of tactical uh, bottlenecks, but fundamentally, I think there are there are three levers here that. Or, or three constraints here that are really important to know. So the first is that LPAs are already resource constrained, particularly around ecology. There was a study done a couple of years ago by ALGI, um, the Association of Local Government Ecologists, which showed that 45% of LPAs at that time, so end of 2021, didn't have an ecologist. And those that did, didn't have, generally didn't have full time access to an ecologist. They shared the ecologist with another organization or another LPA. So LPAs are already really resource constrained. BNG is an additional statutory duty for them. It's non-negotiable uh, and it needs to be done. And it's extremely important uh, to protect uh, the remaining wildlife in uh, Britain and to, uh, in England and to, and to help it kind of recover. And then fundamentally, as Gareth mentioned, BNG is a data and information challenge. Um, Organisations need to understand what the state of biodiversity is at the start, but then track it for 30 years and track it across multiple different stakeholders, local planning authorities, but also developers, facilities, companies, ecological consultants who will change over the 30 years. Um, and it needs so, and this information needs to be uh, kind of processed in such a way that it, uh, it helps people drive to action. So, for example, you need to be able to understand that some areas are more ecologically sensitive or important than others. And that's difficult for humans to do. There's just so much information and so many people need to engage with it. And so actually, it's a perfect problem, if you like, for, so for software to address. Uh, and that's what we're doing with Mycelia. So the bottlenecks are, are those that I mentioned. The software really is the solution. Um, and, and what gets quite interesting and exciting with the view of kind of better ecological and environmental outcomes is the idea in something we're building, which we call the BNG passport. Uh, and that allows for any given site to be tracked right from the start. So when, when a developer starts thinking about the application, all the way through, apl through the, uh, the application process to monitoring reporting for 30 years. And if we get that right, uh, and I think, you know, Werner is, is, is as well placed as any organisation to, to build it and, and we've already started. Uh, if we get that right, that can really address these key bottlenecks. And so we're engaging with partners up and down the value chain, if you like, um, um, and local planning authorities to make that happen. And, and actually, that would be a really significant lever for addressing what we see as the key bottlenecks uh, that potentially could make BNG uh, not work. It's just worth me saying that there's a lot at stake here, not just for English wildlife. Um, but a Harvard Kennedy School paper a couple of months ago said that biodiversity that gains the most exciting and ambitious nature policy in the world right now. Other countries like Singapore, Sweden, Germany and Canada are looking at what we're doing. And so if we make this work, uh, similar policies will spread around the world. If we don't make it work, they won't. And so there's a lot at stake here. And, and you know, our view, of course, is mycelia, the product we've built, uh, is a significant part of the solution. Thanks, Rafi. And uh, <clears throat> I really hope we can be leaders and make sure that it's, uh, you know, paving the way for um, other kind of a type of same type legislation uh, throughout the world. Um, Joe, what would be what is your view on you know, challenges and impact of BNG? Yeah, um, so you mentioned earlier, Isabel, the research that Land Trust did. Um, so in 2022, with the Land Promoters and Developer Federation and with Home Builders Federation, we conducted an industry wide survey. I think we reached around 80 land promoters and house builders developers to work out what they think the challenges are. Um, and broadly, it's around, as we've all mentioned today, the availability of land on site, off site to deliver. BNG, um, availability of biodiversity units. Again, so Helen's touching on that quite a bit already as a house builder. Um, and then the capacity and skill set within local planning authorities. So again, echoing what everybody's saying on the school. So there's no changes there. Um, but from our experience, the land trust, even when there is the skill set in the local planning authority, um, there will be different approaches and requirements of biodiversity net gain. It will be down to the each council's interpretation of biodiversity net gain, how they prioritise it. Um, we're already selling biodiversity units at the land trusts um, and we've been working with Wiltshire Council 
and with Barnsley Council on a couple of offset sites and they're fortunate enough to have ecologists maybe more than one within the team in both councils one might be two might be part-time in Barnsley but still you've got at least one FTE ecologist and even then there's differences between their requirements so to try and me leading on BNG saying one size fits all originally it, it's not going to work um, and this is before mandatory net gain so this is their own interpretation of the MPPF and the requirement to deliver just a gain so just one percent is a gain at the moment fast forward to mandatory net gain and I've got councils saying it's been overcomplicated um, and they wish it had kept it the way it was before it was mandatory because it's much easier to navigate and they're actually they agree with it but they think it's just been taken a bit too far so again it's going to be down to each council's interpretation they set the policy so I think government has said several times you can offset wherever you want in the country and yes that's correct the metric will allow it if you go outside the national character area and the local planning authority i think you need to provide 50 more 50 percent more biodiversity units so you can do it but it's obviously penalized um but then the local planning authorities are getting a bit political and they want to keep it within their boundary so their planning policy will probably limit it to their own boundary and we're seeing that in certain councils already um, councillors do not want their biodiversity offset uh, biodiversity losses to be offset outside so there's going to be complexities where each council requires different things um, I've already mentioned the challenges around transparency and credibility of biodiversity units on the market um, we've mentioned that in the gatekeeping and Gary if you mentioned monitoring is key for biodiversity net gain over 30 years um, you can either be that's down to either the local planning authority under the section 106 or it's down to a responsible body under a conservation covenant and we haven't touched on conservation covenants yet but that's key if you've got an off-site BNG land it doesn't have to have a 106 it could have a conservation covenant with a responsible body so lots of people are concerned again about local planning authorities their monitoring and enforcement under the TCPA is already lacking Town and Country Planning Act sorry acronym already lacking um, so whether they'll be able to monitor and enforce BNG over 30 years, I think DEFRA have acknowledged that and that's why we've now got responsible bodies. Band Trust has seen that as a market, as a window for us, so we've applied to become a responsible body. So we'll be delivering units but also monitoring um, third parties hopefully subject to a successful application. Um, there's lots of challenges with BNG but we've been given lots of time to consider it. Um, the ruling for, um, for SANG another acronym suitable alternative natural green space that came in practically overnight in different places of the country so development halted nutrient neutrality instant ruling no planning consents so those sorts of requirements for offsetting they are true challenges because all of a sudden you've got to deal with it straight away bng helen's been working on it for four years land trust for three years other um House builders, I know Barclay have been delivering it on site already for a number of years and their aim is to keep it on site. They don't want to go off site. So that's their own internal policy. So there's lots of time to prepare for BNG. So hopefully everybody's up the curve on it and it won't be such a mess as nutrient neutrality was or SANG was um, when that ruling came in in various places across the country. Thanks, Joe. I'm not going to let you drink because I could you elaborate a bit more on the conservation covenants, which you just mentioned? Um, yeah, luck. I did the application, so I should know enough about it now. It took me a while to get my head around it. But so as an alternative, so typically um, you'd expect that offsite biodiversity net gain would be secured by a Section 106 planning agreement. And Gareth, you'll know more about planning agreements and 106s and I so correct me if I'm wrong but that's that's the expectation of a 106 it secures it binds the land the council then monitors via the 106 and then if the offset provider isn't doing what they're supposed to they will step in um, enforce do whatever's in their power to get that biodiversity net gain offset site back on track the conservation covenant is a new legal agreement um, it's literally come into force with the environment act so it's new like biodiversity net gain and it doesn't just cover biodiversity net gain, it can cover um, heritage and other sorts of sites where you want to secure the benefits um, and you bind the land with this legal agreement. It negates the need for the local planning authority to get involved and some people see that as a real positive and um, that's not my opinion, it's just what others have said. Um, it allows the offset provider to contract with the, with the responsible body who's somebody that's been approved by DEFRA 
to monitor and enforce the delivery of that biodiversity net gain site or that heritage project. So they are funded by the offset provider under the Conservation Covenant and every one three five and then every five years thereafter they oversee and the reporting that that offset provider needs to carry out. So it's basically it's a legal agreement, a new legal agreement that binds the land and is given powers under the Environment Act to secure biodiversity net gain off sites and heritage sites. Um, so it's quite an exciting new sort of structure to allow legal legally binding land for purposes such as biodiversity net gain and other other projects. Thanks, Director. Um, as we can see, there are a lot of changes with the BNG uh, or the implementation of BNG, and obviously challenges are often a spark for innovation. We can see different kind of avenues for innovation with BNG. There's a technological part, uh, the data, but also innovation around the offsets. So um, question to you all, and the you know, literally who wants to answer? What are the biodiversity offset markets and how do they relate to BNG? We've touched that a little bit, but what is your view on that? What do we see in terms of risks and what do you see in terms of potential for those? Anyone wants to start? Gareth? I, I can happily say a few words to start, but I'm sure there are people on my call who, on this call, on, on the panel who will know more. But I mean, can I just clarify where markets sit because like biodiversity net gain the legislation it does aim to create a market very simply where a developer if they cannot deliver biodiversity on site and they don't have a spare parcel of land to create biodiversity they can look to buy units of biodiversity and they're costed up and as helen said you know these national credits are very much a last resort the, the aim is that local markets for net gain start to 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 develop, which obviously Joe's work and the Land Trust are a big part of, but other organisations are doing that too. And I think for me, it, it's really important to think about the the kind of different scenarios. So just very quickly, if you think about a development, very simply, you're building some houses or a factory or whatever, you do all your on site uh, all your net gain on site pretty straightforward section 106 agreement as joe said local authority signs that you committed they monitor it another part of that it could be some of it is delivered on site and some of it is delivered off site but on a set on a piece of land owned by the same organization so it's a linked site so you know again a similar process and the local authority has to, to sign an agreement to monitor it but the off-site stuff is, you know, the other scenario is it goes to a private, a private bank or a habitat bank, and a local a developer buys that unit in and says, you know, I'm going to build these houses. I need X number of BNG units. I'm buying them. They're here, and I've got a a, a, a kind of an agreement to do that. And as Joe said, that that is through think that can be done through things like the new conservation covenants and that's a legal agreement to to allow that and importantly there will be a national register of all those habitat banks those off-site providers so they have to be properly registered and properly set up so that, that you know there are a number of different scenarios to follow i think although there are challenges there are some fast, fantastic opportunities as well so i think you know local authorities themselves are landowners and some of them are starting to develop their own land. Um, I live in Barnsley, Joe, so I'm really pleased to hear that you're working in Barnsley. I think that's fantastic. When the other local authorities are doing some fantastic work around the country as well, you know, places like Buckinghamshire, they're already up and running to try and develop a market in their area by asking landowners to get in touch and say are you interested in developing a, a land bank and starting to put them in touch with developers who might be able to pay for credit so they, they say they act like a tinder service for bng and developers they start matching up the two to try and encourage that market to happen and i think that's really important as well but but the other area that i'm interested in is the strategic impact of net gain so where will net grain have the greatest benefit for a place and that's really important that a local authority works strategically to identify the sites and the area 
where, where they feel that, that net gain is going to be most important. And of course, that's where things like local nature recovery strategies come in, which we might want to order. But it is important, you know, water systems, field systems, mountains, hills don't stop at a local authority border. We've got to look beyond just our local authority place to see how, how we can really maximise the benefits of BNG. So I, I think it's challenging but exciting, shall we say, Isabel. And I can't agree more on the kind of a not being, you know, staying within boundaries. Um, Helen, did you want to? Yeah, just to, um, I guess, support Gareth's point around strategic planning for biodiversity. I think um, it's, a, it's an area that I think has been missing. I know that it's been done in some um, local planning authority areas where they have AOBs or areas of outstanding beauty and, and, and biodiversity um, uh, biodiversity areas. And But there's not been this big strategic link across the whole country. And that's really what would be, I think that would be a game changer, quite frankly, for, for not just developers, but for, for others that are trying to engage in, in re really reversing that trend in biodiversity loss that we are experiencing in the UK. Um, so, so to support the local nature recovery strategies, absolutely. But the other thing that we've got to be cognizant of is to not be too focused just on biodiversity net gain. There are a host of other uh, ecosystem services, uh, including agriculture, you know, that we depend on in this country. And so isolating one aspect of that you know rich uh, um, uh, ecosystem just for biodiversity may be missing certain opportunities so thinking about biodiversity but also thinking about the wider ecosystem services that we can uh, obtain from um, these these large stretches of, of land across the UK um, is really important so stacking of benefits is one of the words that we've been we've been talking about and how you go about doing that is another challenge which I'm sure Joe is going to tell us the answer to. Joe? I couldn't resist it um you know what I'm going to talk about Helen it, it's um so what we're seeing now already happening is stacking of biodiversity net gain on top of the acronym I mentioned earlier which is suitable alternative natural green space Suitable alternative natural green space is a ruling in certain parts of the country where recreational impact from new residential development is damaging protected sites, SPAs, SACs. Oh, sorry, more acronyms, but basically protected sites used to be protected under European law. Now it's been it's been changed in the jargon, techni the technical words behind it has changed. But basically it's trying to stop primarily dog walkers walking on protected sites. It's just it happened a couple of years ago in the Chilton Beachwoods. Um, it's spreading across the country. It started in Thames Basin 14 years ago. Um, so we're seeing now where developers need to provide a SANG, which is basically it's a mitigation site. So their residents will walk on this SANG instead of the protected site. So SANG's already the sort of um, ecosystem services, rec recreational benefits, and you can sell it to third parties. It's got a SANG capacity. You can sell it on a pair of dwelling tariff. On top of the SANG, which is essentially it's a large walking destination. You've got a baseline of what you need to provide for a SANG, and that's just quite plain, normal habitats. And then on top of that, you can enhance those habitats to deliver a biodiversity net gain, and that's delivering units. So you can be selling SANG capacity and selling biodiversity units from one site. So that's a real, really good and live example of stacking um, biodiversity net gain on top of other sort of ecosystem services. And it's one that's very, it's increasing Land Trust is best known for taking on SANGs in the South. Um, it's what I started doing at the Land Trust uh, when I was a graduate 10 years ago. So we're now seeing this BNG on SANG being delivered across England. And it's a really exciting opportunity that people are taking chance of because everybody talks about stacking and there's sort you can you can't stack carbon on top of biodiversity net gain, but you can deliver it in the corner of a biodiversity net gain site, and that's complicated. But with SANG and BNG, you can stack it on top of the same site and you're using the same red line boundary to deliver two quite important sort of benefits and the income from that. SANG outweighs biodiversity net gain. You can make more money from SANG, but when you stack them on top of each other, you are, I wouldn't say, I don't want to get into figures, but maximising that value of land. And developers are clocking onto that and they're looking to do that on their sites. So that's an example of how BNG is now being merged with SANG that's been around for years. And it's a really exciting opportunity for developers to look at and landowners, any private landowner with land 
where SANG is required and BNG it should be everywhere. So I think the stacking is a really interesting approach and thanks for kind of elaborating on that. Um, I see obviously that there are risks associated uh, and, um, and needs. Um, what are the mechanisms that are used? Gareth, you mentioned the uh, National Register, uh, but who holds the register for uh, the BNG uh, sites? And, um, and how can you make sure that uh, there is verification on site of the credits or the availability of credits, the quality uh, of the of the diversity biodiversity. You understand? I think I'm right to say yeah. So Natural England, the government body, will be managing the register. I understand. I'm looking at Helen for a nod because I think that this is all coming out quite new, isn't it, Helen? I think so. So. so Natural England will be responsible for the register, yeah. but at the moment it isn't published. I, our guess is it's going to be published on the 12th of February when this thing goes live. So again, we're going to be learning about that when it goes live. But but as Jill said, you know, we've been here before with other environmental and big changes in planning. So, you know, we'll we'll deal with that. So so the the kind of national uh, it will be the legal agreement, the conservation covenant between the landowner where the units are and the developer that will be kind of, uh, sorry, the responsible body where the units are on that register and the, the the developer that will seek to ensure that those units are delivered. So so that's a, a, a an important point of, of, of having that, that national register. But, but I do think you know that that local authority role in 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 monitoring will be so important when it comes to sites. I think Joe's already said. You know there will be political pressure to try and deliver net gain as close to a development site as possible, and that's understandable. You know if you're a local councillor, you've seen a couple of hundred houses built in your ward, your local residents are going to say, okay, where where is that net gain? What what does help improve our Roma? The closer it is, the better. So I think local authorities will have to get smarter at doing that monitoring and i think that is where some of the innovation will will, will have to come in really but you know we do know that's a bit of a poor relation in planning you know monitoring hasn't been done very well and very easily because there's not many resources to do it the benefit of net gain is is that the government defra that department for environment food and rural affairs another acronym are bringing in our bringing you know giving additional funding to local authorities because this is a new duty so they, they will be getting more resources to do it plus where local authorities are being enterprising and innovative they are you know charging developers pre-application for planning advice or setting up planning performance agreements so that developers can help fund authorities to make sure that some of this uh, experience and knowledge and uh, is is required as well but i think you know there are lots of local authorities and lots of way of doing it and while it will be different i think our job is to make sure that it's consistent and good across the country and that's what what we'll be aiming to do thank you very much um so obviously you know the the market and the off-site um uh, market is one side but uh, if we go into the kind of the more technological approach uh, there's a lot of new technology that is emerging uh, from the from the BNG, the implementation of the BNG um, around monitoring, verification outcomes. Um, any any kind of views on um, where we are going and what is working, not working, Rafi? Yeah, I think there are two kind of strands of where technology can help around this. One is uh, kind of remote monitoring and the other is around um, kind of making sure that the work can be done um, and, and by that I mean storing everything in the same place in the right place processing it in the right way helping prioritize actions and then helping support uh, actions as well to actually make uh, turn the information into better uh, environmental outcomes now I think the latter one you know I, I, I'm biased but I think my CD basically takes care of it um, in terms of the remote monitoring, it's interesting because biodiversity is so much more complex than carbon or climate. Um, translating the approaches that, that have worked around 
the climate context aren't necessarily always right in biodiversity. And so I think there's a big risk. Um, I, I think ultimately it will be possible to do remote monitoring of around biodiversity, but I think in the short to medium term, uh, we need to be careful to be really, um, uh, to, to, to make sure that remote monitoring is sufficiently accurate in order to drive better environmental outcomes. And, and it's really challenging now that you, know, you, you can't really do it with AI and satellite. You need a little bit more granularity than that. And think, I, I, and all it takes is for you know major errors to be noticed uh, in, in one path, and then it you know kibosh the whole whole process, even though you know it might be the right way. And so I think two things: one, technology has to be part of the answer. There is a resource constraint of of, of ecologists uh, across the country, even more so within LPAs. Uh, and this is a really hard challenge to to sort. So we need innovation. Uh, we need technology, but we need to make sure as well that we deploy the right technology at the right times when it's ready uh, in the right way. Thanks, Joe. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rafa. I agree. There's remote sen sensing. Uh, there's a big market for it. Um, it needs to come a long way, in my opinion. We, we, the Land Trust baseline using remote sensing, 2,300 hectares, so our state, um, and then we ground through some of it. And it really shows the lack of accuracy you get from ground truthing. We, our approach is very similar to the approach that DEFRA have ever taken for the Living in the England um, map layer uh, they have on the website, where it's looking at um, aerial imagery, infrared imagery, and then you also uh, go to ground to ground truth. It. We've looked at Living England and they claim an 80% accuracy, I think, but on three of our sample sites, it, it wasn't near 80%, unfortunately. So it really shows there's a lack of, you, you can't replace boots on the ground, essentially. So then I agree with your next point about ecologists. There is a massive shortage and we need more experienced ecologists. Land Trust itself is looking at recruiting internally because relying on third parties causes an issue and time scale issues. Um, so there is, there is a role for tech. But at the moment, I'm not convinced that it will replace an ecologist going on the ground and surveying it because local planning authorities wouldn't accept remote sensing for our offset sites. They always say you have to have the, the walkover evidence and the metric has to be populated as such using that data. I know. Thanks, Joe. Helen? So just to come in and support both of those points, I mean, we've also started using uh, remote se se uh, surveying, I should say, um, to, to try and get a really early idea of the baseline, but it has to be caveated and, and used with a huge pinch of salt at the moment, but they're still very useful because now that we have a, an idea of where those, those uh, potential sites of but grassland types that are important or woodlands that are important, we can send an ecologist to that site to, to specifically look at those areas. So although not we don't have a massive amount of confidence in it at the moment, it should help um, save time when we do manage to get hold of a consultant because they are like hen's teeth and, um, and, and, and at the right time of the year. So, so there's all these things that we need to put in place, uh, but it's, it's a useful starting point. I would say. Thanks, Anne. It's really about using technology as an enabler. Rafi, you on mute? You on mute? You have to have to someone, and it was me this time. Um, I, I just, you know, building on the points that have, have just been said, I think, you know, really the, the key is, you know, we, there's a real supply constraint of ecologists. Ecologists are absolutely key to BNG and, and a bunch of other ecological considerations as well. And so technology has to have the role in helping them leverage their time and expertise to do more. Um, and the examples that have been given, uh, Mycelia, uh, the examples given by Helen and Joe uh, are exactly around that. Gareth? Yeah, I'm aware we're running out of time, but I think that's a really good point. Yeah, ecologists are lacking. But we would say we say sometimes ecologists are as rare as some of their species that they're trying to protect sometimes. And and so everyone wants to look after them. But equally, I think there's a big part of it, like you say, Rafi, what can we do that doesn't require ecologists? So we talk a lot about triaging, you know, some application, you know, an all, a big a big planning authority can get 200, 2000 applications a year. You don't want you want to have an army of ecologists couldn't look at all those. So how do you triage to remove the ones 
and focus and what we talk to local authorities about you know prioritize on those that are going to have the really biggest effect and the biggest opportunities that's important when it comes to application but I think the other side of the equation we talked a lot about planning applications and how we deal with you know development schemes but starting even earlier than that as Helen and I have started to say it's looking at where your really important habitats are where your really important um, opportunities are so on our uh, uh, website we've got case studies from places like Birmingham and Sheffield who are using mapping to kind of pinpoint some of the most important areas for nature recovery and biodiversity net gain and that's where you can then focus the boots on the ground that's where you can then start to say these are the sites that we do want to focus on so so I, I do think it is that that combination of of expertise but also good technology and, and just good management of planning services really. Thank you very much. So we are running out of time. So I would just ask a very kind of quick one word from each of the panelists. Um, BNG is a long term view on the world. Give us like in one word your hope for the next 10, 30 years for BMG. BNG. Gareth, you're off mute, so you can start. Do I have to start first on that? Yeah, you are off well, mute. <laughs> OK, can I sound, say something that might sound controversial? I say it's so important and so you know i think you know such a big opportunity and so and so critical as a paradigm shift to what we're doing but actually my big hope is that bng becomes normal and mainstream i.e it's not a special thing that's done separately it's part of the day-to-day -day work of planning authorities and it's seen alongside all the other important things like you know kind of transport infrastructure schools and doctors that it's just this is what we have to do to create good places. So that's that's my hope. What can I say as well, I'm going to put a link to our website, a bit of a plug for some FAQs and things that we do put on our website that might be useful to people, not just local authorities, but anyone interested in this field. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Gareth. Rafi? Yeah. I'm going to, uh, Gareth made such a good point, and I'm going to kind of join us. So obvious, I think. I think in, in 10 years' time, we're going to look back and think it was completely bizarre that we didn't take into account biodiversity as a central consideration uh, in supply chains, both in, in construction and planning, but also others. Uh, and so I think you know, BNG will just seem obvious uh, in 10 years time. Joe? Oh, Helen, sorry, you were out of me. <laughs> oh, um, thank you. Yeah, I uh, have said this loads of times, but um, we've seen this in the past that not one sector will reverse the, the, the trend in biodiversity loss. We really need to start uh, amalgamating commercial, uh, government and uh, and third sector, NGO conservation organisations to work together to do this. Not one sector can do it on their own. So that's my big hope for BNG. Thanks, Helen. Joe? Very quickly, um, I'd like to see greater protection of biodiversity net gain land after 30 years. At the moment, it's not protected. It could be ploughed up by a farmer and there's nothing to stop them. So greater protection beyond 30 years. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I really want to thank you all for joining today and especially the panelists. So thank you, Helen, Rafi, Gareth and Joe for taking the time. Uh, it's been really a pleasure. I've learned a lot. It's really been really interesting. Uh, thanks for making the effort to not use too many acronyms or at least explain them, <laughs> which was great. I know it's not necessarily easy. Um, please do fill the feedback survey and remember to share with your networks all the open calls we have for the accelerator program and for the awards. The next positive impact panel session will be on the 27th of February and it will be on local um, authority energy.